My name's Juliet Foster, and I'll be acting as your moderator in the discussion that follows in a few moments and in a series of debates that will be held in the course of the next few days. I want to take this opportunity to put these discussions into their fullest context. For those of you who might not be aware, the Darendorf Symposium is a high-profile event that analyzes Europe's future. It takes place every two years, is attended by policymakers, geopolitical experts, economists, foreign policy analysts, and, of course, media representatives. Now, this present event is a culmination of almost 18 months' work, and over the coming days, we will be joined by a number of distinguished political and diplomatic figures. Now, the symposium itself is hosted by the Darendorf Forum, which is a joint initiative between the Hertie School of Governance, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Stiftung Mercator, a private and independent foundation that strives for openness to the world, solidarity, and equal opportunities. Now, their initiative is based on a wide network of academic and policy experts alike, located in Europe and beyond. This bringing together honors the work and the legacy of the late Ralph Darendorf, who's remembered as a leading social scientist and an intellectual with a passionate commitment to the European idea of unity and cooperation. In keeping with his values, the Darendorf Forum promotes critical thinking on the policy challenges affecting Europe, whilst shining a much-needed light on ideas and perspectives that have either been ignored or underrepresented. The objective is not to criticize, but to encourage new ways of thinking. In other words, constructing the intellectual tools for tomorrow's policymakers to push Europe forward in its journey. Ralph Darendorf had a vision of a democratic, united Europe with a diverse civil society that would bring strength to its social and moral fiber. Yet seven years after his death, Europe is wrestling with a multitude of forces that have widened divisions amongst allies, leading some to even question the viability of a European Union. Issues of identity, external security threats, integration and sovereignty have always existed. Yet major events like the crisis in Ukraine and the Syrian civil war with its mass population displacement have exposed the depth of those fissures. They, in turn, have been seized upon by ultra-nationalist and xenophobic movements who've exploited the fear and uncertainty to fuel their own political growth. So the question is, what is the way forward? How can the EU mould relations with its border regions as well as those with key players in the global economy, like North America and Asia? Have the shifting geopolitical sands rendered the concept of a united Europe as worthless? They're questions that Britain in particular is engaged with as politicians of every ideological shade prepare the ground for the June referendum on Britain's EU membership. In the words of Winston Churchill, the British are, and I quote, with Europe, but not of it. Now, though debating time has not been put aside for this issue, do not be surprised if the Brexit shadow occasionally rears its very large head. It will. Now, the more than 70 speakers taking part in this symposium will be discussing a wide range of subjects, including Europe's foreign policy challenges and foreign policy options going forward for 2025, whether economic globalization is a threat, the consequences for Europe from global power shifts, and the challenges from populism, illiberalism, and radicalism. There will also be contributions from five interdisciplinary working groups that will bring into their discussions European and non-European perspectives whilst addressing the EU's relationship with the rest of the world. So now that you have an idea of, uh, well, an outline, I should say, of what is going to happen, I would like to say a very special thank you to four people whose hard work and dedication have made this 2016 symposium possible. We will hear from them individually. The first of these is Wolfgang Rohe, who's the executive director, Stiftung Mercator in Essen. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Juliet, for this the introduction and also that you will uh, moderate uh, this whole event during the next two days. Thank you for that. Lady Darendorf, distinguished guests, 
ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome also from my side to this 2016 Darendorf Symposium in Berlin. I'm delighted that all of you have accepted the joint invitation by the London School of Economics and Political Science, the Hertie School, and Stiftung Mercator. This year's symposium is a climax of a two-year research cycle on the topic Europe and the world. This title might sound strange uh, in some years, but its inherent message is relevant more than ever. Issues such as global warming, terrorism, migration, the consequences of global conflicts clearly reveal that Europe cannot tackle its great challenges on its own. Close cooperation between the EU member states as well as between Europe and other world regions is needed. But is there a joint European view on global challenges at all? Does Europe act jointly when it comes to major challenges? And how does the rest of the world look at Europe? Is it seen as a relevant political actor or rather as a sum of different national states? For Stiftung Mercator, these are crucial questions. The future of Europe is one of our core topics. We strive to strengthen Europe's cohesion and its willingness and ability to act. We are convinced that exchange and cooperation across national and thematic borders are crucial to face major societal challenges. With our project, we try to increase the capabilities for cooperation and joint acting. We are very happy that China and Turkey are two of the focus regions within the Darendorf Forum. Both countries play a key role in Mercator's programs. We consider Turkey to be a part of Europe, regardless of the question of its EU accession. As a main transit and receiving country for refugees, Turkey is receiving a lot of attention in the current European discussion on migration. For the EU member states, a solution to the refugee crisis seems impossible without Turkish cooperation. Europe might face a turning point. The role and future of the European continent has not been as uncertain for a long time. How Europe and its most important partner regions cooperate over the next years will substantially influence Europe's importance and the global context. The Darendorf project offers more than cutting edge research. What makes it special is that it combines academic excellence with profound policy recommendations. By bringing together all of you, leading representatives of academia, politics, economy, civil society, and media, the Darendorf Symposium encourages a pro-European debate across borders. I do want to thank our partners from the London School of Economics and the Hertie School ever since the beginning of the first project cycle in 2011, and I just talked to Michael Cox about these very few, very early years of uh, this, this project. It has been a pleasure to cooperate with you and to develop the projects over the years. I'm looking forward to stimulating discussions about the future of Europe's foreign relations. I invite you all to participate vigorously, and I wish us inspiring days of a debate. And it's my great pleasure to hand over now to Lady Darendorf, who accompanied the Darendorf Forum actively right from the beginning. Thank you. Dear Dr. Rohe, Professor Anheyer, Professor Faulkner, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor and pleasure to attend this important symposium seven years after my late husband, Ralf Darendorf, died. Europe is confronted with shifts in global power at a time when its citizens face change and challenges on many levels. Difficult times for a European foreign policy indeed. Fritz Stern, the closest friend of Ralf Darendorf, since the early 1950s was afraid of an imminent era of fear and a rising anti-liberal anti tide. 
the visionary crier, Alle Menschen werden Brüder, in 1989 and 91, united old enemies, victorious and defeated nations. But hope has faded in one generation. Euphoria changed to a growing awareness of unique member states, each country with its history and values, relating to very different neighbors and allies. Disappointment of elites and European institutions it wrote trust in the European project. But tensions arise in every single country too, domestic politics often limiting foreign policy. Even identities become more complex with many roles and bonds. Think of the newly elected major of London, Sadi Khan, who proudly describes himself as a Muslim British human rights lawyer born to immigrant parents from Pakistan. How do men and women deal with challenging choices in a less secure world if only fighting climate change, poverty, hunger would need all our efforts? Most people are concerned, if not afraid. Confronted with unknown unknowns, many people at least flirt with the idea of strong leaders promising ethnically homogenous nation states or aspects of religion which, which exclude the other. Populism is on the rise in every country in Europe. However, dividing societies and countries into us against them is not easy anymore. In Timothy Garten, Ash's Cosmopolis, without realizing it, we all became neighbors in a global world, first virtually, but now often physically rubbing shoulders in megacities. In his new book, Free Speech, Garten Ash asks how we could adapt to this new reality and create conditions in which we agree on how to disagree, urgently needed as the right to free speech is diminishing again in many countries. Europe was constructed according to experience, values, and visions of an earlier generation. Now most voters and politicians lived their formative years in, peaceful world, in a peaceful period. We have to learn quickly to cope with terrorism at the center of our societies, and in our social spaces, a rise of nuclear weapons, hybrid war, and how to contain or end it. Germany's new role is ambivalent for Germans and others alike. With the necessary steep learning curve for all of us, is there anything that could strengthen civil society if, according to Kahn, fear does not make us safer? Maybe trying to build trust again, respecting otherness in Europe and beyond. Certainly there are more questions than answers. A wonderful opportunity for a symposium. Thank you. Thank you to Lady Christiana Darendorf. I would like to introduce the third of our speakers, Helmut K. Anheyer, President and Dean of the Hertie School and Academic Co-Director of the Darendorf Forum. Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. i um, very much like to thank uh, Lady Darendorf for being with us uh, here today. Uh, we're very honored by your presence and we greatly appreciate the support you've given us over uh, these last few years and indeed for the first two and now the third Darendorf Forum. Uh, as you know, uh, your, your late husband was convinced of the fundamental responsibility of intellectuals. And let me begin with that. In 1963, uh, when his academic and political career was being established, he wrote, intellectuals are to doubt all received wisdom, to wonder at all that is taken for granted, to question all authority, and to pose all those questions that otherwise no one else dares to ask. And with this project, the Darndorf Forum, and the symposium today, we want to honor precisely this intellectual legacy, a legacy of someone who was a political intellectual, but also an intellectual politician at the same time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Darndorf never took Europe for granted. He was always aware of the fragility of the project. Over the course of nearly five decades, he repeatedly and publicly raised very uncomfortable questions about this continent of ours. 
its achievements, its potential, its weaknesses, but especially he fought for Europe as a democratic project, but also, one has to add, as an economic and political power. And I want to share three versions of his fight for Europe. After a brief period in the German parliament, serving as state secretary in the foreign office, Darendorf became commissioner for external relations and trade in the European Commission in 1970. Under the name, or nom de plume, one should say, Make a point. Yeah, sorry. This is a very sensitive uh, machine here. Under the uh, Norm de Plume Wieland, Europa Darendorf blamed the first Europe, i.e. the achievement of the European communities, the EC at that time, for being concerned with coal, butter, sugar, fish, and meat. He called for a second Europe and a more political Europe for overcoming the problems created by the first. He, suggest, he suggested regular consultations of all ministries and, in quote, habit-forming cooperation in as many areas of policymaking as appropriate. In other words, more horizontal integration rather than any undue focus on Brussels. Sounds familiar? In the early 1980s, as director of the LSE and against the backdrop of the winter of discontent and Thatcherism, he drew a very critical picture of the development of the EC, depicting it as a, quote, grouping of partly unwilling members without objective, end quote. And he continued saying, they're working in an intransparent chaos of institutions in which an elected parliament acts without functions and competencies. He raised the fundamental questions. Why do we include visions, grand visions, in official documents, also we know that these will remain visions because nobody knows how we can get rid of the paralyzed Europe of today. Sounds familiar? In 1993, then appointed life peer, he still felt that his critique of earlier decades remained valid, but he concentrated more on concrete steps that could make the U U European Union, as we then called it, more relevant for its citizens and the world. He recommended, among others, to include an updated European Convention on Human Rights in the EU treaties as a way to increase citizen identification with Europe by granting unalienable rights. He also recommended to strengthen the democratic accountability of the European Commission by strengthening a less a, a less self-referential European Parliament, as he referred to it sometimes. And he advised to make social cohesion and social justice a crucial objective for the future and not to make Europe the project of elite. He cautioned very strongly on that point. Looking back and looking forward, it is remarkable, is it not, how valid his criticism and how relevant his suggestions remain. Darendorf rejected the argument that Europe would develop automatically and inevitably by some magic logic or formula towards an ever closer union. History, he said, does not work that way, he said. Instead, he argued that concrete, pragmatic political steps are needed to move the European Union forward. For him, Europe was a deeply normative concept that stands for human rights, the rule of law, and checks and balances. The EU should play an appropriate role in the world today, if possible, with the United States. And in the absence of global rules and agreements, and knowing of the weakness of the United Nations system, he felt that a European project should serve as an important model for others as well. And these include, undoubtedly, many tensions. And these tensions led us then to develop the forum that we will have over the next few days. I will list only two or three of these tensions. The current EU-Europe EU as a model for post-national cooperation stands in tension with the need for continuous reinvention of Europe from inside and the challenges of renationalization. And Juliet already reminded us of Brexit. Right. Another tension is the pragmatic top-down solutions by policymakers versus 
popular forms of decision making from below, even if we do not like it. Look at the challenge of populism today. An emerging European civil society actively engaged in shaping the European project, in many ways part of his dream, versus the majority of citizens in this part of the world feeling quite indifferent towards the EU and how it operates, and the challenges of the European model as an elite project. And finally, a hesitant political Europe in a fast-changing world of geopolitics. Look at how long it has taken us up to come closer, not even close to it, but edge closer to having a common, a common foreign policy. So a hesitant Europe on, this one, on one side and the challenges and indeed the temptations of this continent taking early retirement from what used to be the center of world power. These are just some of the tensions that Darendorf wanted us to think about and continue to think about. They were very dear to his heart and I think they are at, attention, at the center of what we will discuss over the next few days. And you can easily see, and let me on, end on this, that Ralph Darendorf, with all his brilliance, has given us much work to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would like to introduce the final speaker, Robert Faulkner, who's the Associate Professor of International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science and Academic Co-Director of the Darendorf Forum. Robert Faulkner. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Helmut, Herr Roth, Lady Darendorf. I also want to welcome you all warmly to the symposium on behalf of the LSE, and I should add the LSE Ideas. Professor Mick Cox, our director, is with us today. As Helmut noted, Darndorf never took Europe for granted. It's an important point to note. He wanted it strengthened, he wanted it renewed, but he wanted it reformed too. It's in this spirit that we have developed a program in this symposium that opens the debate on Europe, on its external relations and its position in the world. We wish to make academic debates and research digestible accessible to a wider public debate. We want to create a space for critical reflection where not just academics but also policymakers and other groups in society can freely engage in that debate about Europe's future. And this goes very much to the heart of Darendorf's intentions, both as a public intellectual and as a program for the social sciences. I'm not going to dwell much longer on this. You've heard from Helmut and others about the great legacy in which we're following here. I just want to take a few moments to explain to you the logic of the program. And I'm sure you will have seen the program we've developed is a hefty one, and it may even be a confusing one. So what I want to do is set out very briefly the logic of what's going to happen over the next three days. We've spread out the program over three days, and I'm tempted to say the program will unfold in three acts. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm looking at our colleague from Mercato. I'm not talking of a Greek tragedy here. I'm talking of screenwriting, which is perhaps a safer platform from which to develop a three-act model. The model is familiar to you. Act one is where we find the dramatic setup. Act two is where the director introduces confrontation. And then act three luckily produces the resolution. So, with that model in mind... <laughs> right, I, I, I clearly have forgotten one act, uh, which I have omitted. Ah, thank you. We start today, the first act, which is our opening panel. This follows on straight after the opening talks which offers a kind of intellectual setup for the symposium. The panel will discuss Europe in an era of global power shifts, and it introduces some of those challenges that Europe faces globally. This will set us up, in other words, for the remainder of the program. Tomorrow comes Act Two. I'm, I'm hesitant to press the button. Thank you. Which introduces sources of confrontations. These confrontations arise in many parts of the world some nearer, some further away. For the morning session, we have asked 
the five working groups that have already been mentioned, they've been working hard for the last year and a half to prepare thematic sessions on their regions. You will have chosen your groups already. You will be sent off to focus on the challenges that arise in these contexts. This will take up all of tomorrow morning. After lunch, we then come back to bring everyone, both the audience and the speakers, together in here in the plenary to deal with three broadly defined but challenging topics that Europe faces. These will be the panels that you see listed here, and they will take us all the way through till the evening. Threats to economic globalization, the rise of populism and illiberalism, and global order and power shifts. On the third day, the act that is supposed to bring resolution, we hope indeed to find some of the answers that we need to address the questions of the preceding two days. The morning panel will present some of the findings of our scenarios, working groups that have worked tirelessly to develop ideas about where Europe will find itself in 2025. And following on from that, a panel will then discuss Europe's response. We are in the making of the new European global strategy. It is not public yet, but we have invited key actors in this field to tell us about where this is headed, and we hope, therefore, to find some resolution at least there. And we conclude with a final panel that reflects on the findings of the day. So I think you will find the program is rich, it is varied, it is heavy. I think I uh, speak for all organizers. We, we wish you to engage with us. We wish you to be active, not be in the position of consumers, but in the position of a darn Dorfian who engages, who will not take conventional wisdom lying down, who will challenge received wisdom. So I hope you will all make the most of this, and I wish you um, great enjoyment too. We will have opportunities to celebrate. But I do not wish to stand in the way of the first act anymore. So with that, thank you all for coming. And I now hand over to Juliet to get us started on the first panel. Thank you all.